Okay, well, my name's uh, Tony Jorm. I uh, work at the University of Melbourne in the School of Population and Global Health, and we have a centre for mental health there. And I was asked to do this talk by uh, Tony Clarkson. And he said that uh, people in the foundation use the term evidence-based, but he feels that people have different meanings of that. So he asked me to prepare a talk where I could explain what the experts on evidence-based mean by the term. So uh, a difficulty I find in giving this talk is that I don't know your background. Uh, he's given me some information about the sort of roles you have, but when you don't know the background knowledge people have, you can assume uh, too much, in which case they start over your head, or I can assume too little, and I'm telling you things you already know. So what I've tried to do is assume as little as possible, but you're well, welcome to interrupt at any time if I'm doing something that is assuming too much, but I hope I won't. Okay, so I had a look at um, this term evidence-based, which occurred first of all in the phrase evidence-based medicine, and I looked at some definitions that are around, and I'm gonna discuss two of them. This is the first one. Evidence-based medicine is the process of systematically finding, appraising, and using contemporaneous research findings as the basis for clinical decisions. For decades, people have been aware of the gaps between research evidence and clinical practice, and the consequences in terms of expensive, ineffective, or even harmful decision-making. Inexpensive electronic databases and widespread computer literacy now give doctors access to enormous amounts of data. Evidence-based medicine is about asking questions finding and appraising the relevant data and harnessing that information for everyday clinical practice. So that definition came from an article written in 1995. And it's very much saying, I am a clinician, medical clinician. I have um, to make decisions about uh, you know, clinical testing or clinical treatment. And I can now, because computer databases are available, I can search for what the evidence shows and I can use that to help me make decisions in the patient's interest, and that's evidence-based. Here's another uh, definition, um, and this came from someone called Sackett and, and colleagues in 1996. Sackett seems to be one of the big names in the area, and it's a little bit different, subtly different. They say, evidence-based medicine is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. The practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical experience with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. Good doctors use both individual clinical expertise and the best available external evidence, and neither alone is enough. Without clinical expertise, practice risks becoming tyrannized by evidence, but even excellent external evidence may be inapplicable or be inappropriate for an individual patient. Without current best evidence, practice risks becoming rapidly out of date to the detriment of patients. So this definition is a little bit different from the first one. The first one saying, I'm a clinician, I'm making some decision about this patient's problem, and I'm using the evidence from these databases to guide me in my decision. Sackett's saying it's more of a two-way process. It's saying, don't just look at the evidence and apply it. It's saying, you have you as a clinician, you have all this practical experience and it's combining that practical experience with the evidence and making a judgment using the combination of the two. So it's much more of a, it's much more of a two way street than the first definition. So what I guess I'm saying is there are subtle differences in the literature about the way it's used. Now I wondered when did this term evidence base begin? So one way to find out is now Google they scan lots of books and you can go onto Google Books and they have lots of pages of books, huge numbers of books, and you can do searches of terms in those books. So I did a search for the term evidence-based. You can do it right through the 19th century, but I thought I'd start at 1970 up to the early 2000s. And this shows the frequency of the term. And you can see around 1995, it was beginning to creep up. So that's when it came in. It hasn't always been around. And then it's just been growing ever since and seems to be continuing to grow. So you know, it's a growing concept. So when you say, well, evidence-based medicine, we're using all this evidence around to guide our decisions, there are some key tools that people use. And I'm gonna take you through these ones. I'll tell you what they are. And they're gonna go through each one, one at a time. 
Some of these you might already know about, but probably others you, you may not have heard about. So the first one is PubMed, then there's levels of evidence, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, the Cochrane Collaboration, the Campbell Collaboration, the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, NREP, and then Clinical Practice Guidelines. So the first one is PubMed. Now, if there was a live audience, I'd say, who's used PubMed? Because a lot of people use it, and I may be telling you what you already know. So PubMed is, is Medline. It's a database of summaries of abstracts of the medical research literature. And some years ago, the US uh, Congress and Senate passed a law making it freely available. Up till that time, you had to have uh, access to basically a large library, like an academic library, to use it. But then they made it publicly available and you could just get it on your laptop. I use it every day. It's, it's very useful. So, for example, I went into PubMed and I put in the words, you can see at the top there, problem gambling treatment review, because I want to find out what reviews there were of treatments for problem gambling. And it gives me a list of uh, articles there, starting from the most recent, which was Measuring Treatment Outcomes in Gambling Disorders, a systematic review, published in 2017. And you can go back right to the beginning and you see there, are, it says there are items one to 20 of 104. So I found 104 uh, treatment reviews on problem gambling there. So I went into one of those. Um, I went into this one, a systematic review of treatments of problem gambling was published in Psychology of Addictive Behaviors in 2017. And here it tells me how they uh, did a review of all the uh, evidence on what works for gambling problems. And at the end, uh, you can say, um, you can see the bottom line uh, outcomes that they say, or, although most studies found some benefits from cognitive behavior therapy alone or in combination with motivational interviewing and brief feedback or advice rather than the control condition in the short term. Only a handful of studies demonstrated any long-term benefits. So basically they're saying uh, that, that there are these uh, therapies that do seem to have evidence, but we only know about the short-term effects and not the long-term. So that could be something a clinician then uses to guide uh, choice of treatment. Now, when people carry out these systematic reviews and look at the evidence for treatment, they use something called levels of evidence and there are different schemes. Like, the National Health and Medical Research Council has one. I'm showing you here one from 1999. This was an earlier version. They've got newer versions and they're much more complex and hard to show, but this gives you the idea. So the, the whole idea behind this evidence-based medicine is that there are stronger types of evidence and weaker types. So they have levels that go from one, Roman one, ran down to Roman four. So level one evidence at the top, is evidence obtained from a systematic review of all relevant RCTs, randomized controlled trials. Level two is evidence obtained from at least one properly designed randomized controlled trial. I made a mistake there, it should be RCT. Level three, one is evidence obtained from well-designed pseudo randomized controlled trials. This is where you have a control group, you don't randomly assign. And then they've got level three, two, evidence obtained from comparative studies with concurrent controls and allocation not randomized case control studies or interrupted time series with the control group. Level 3.3, three, evidence obtained from comparative studies with historical control, two or more single arm studies or interrupted time series without parallel control group. Level 4, evidence obtained from case series, either post-test or pre-test, post-test. A lot of technical detail there, but I just want to get over at this stage the concept of these levels where there's stronger or weaker evidence that people use. Now, there are other schemes. This is one that commonly used, it's the Oxford Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine Levels of Evidence. And it's very similar. So up the top, 1A, you have the systematic review of homogeneity. That means you review the, the uh, randomised control trials, the RCT, and they're all showing very similar results. That's, uh, that's homogeneity, that's the top level. The next level is you have an individual randomised control trial with a narrow composite, that gives you a rather precise estimate. And down the bottom level five, you've got expert opinion or based on physiology, bench research, or first principles. So when people do the, review the evidence, these are the sort of classifications they use to try and look at the strength of evidence. Here's another one. This is from Joanna Briggs Institute, which is a nursing research institute based in Adelaide, but it, it has international affiliates and they, they systematically review evidence. And again, it's very similar, level one, experimental designs. Level 1A, systematic review of randomized control trials. Level 1B, systematic review of randomized control trials in other study designs. 
level 1C randomized control trial, 1D pseudo randomized control trial. So then you go down the bottom, level 5, expert opinion and bench research, and then they have three levels of expert opinion, systematic review of expert opinion, expert consensus, and bench research, single expert opinion. So I'll say more about those levels later on and uh, some of the problems with them. So when people use these level of evidence, they often apply it to what they call a systematic review. So a systematic review is just a way of looking at all the evidence, but it's a very rigorous way. And it's an attempt to find all the evidence and not bias it in any way by looking for positive evidence. So people often try and find even unpublished uh, results. Um, they go through, you know, postgraduate theses, like right, PhD theses, and if they can't get data from an article, they write to the author. So it's a very rigorous process. So a systematic review, it's a systematic review. It aims to provide a complete exhaustive summary of current literature relevant to a research question. So a research question might be, you know, what is the best treatment for problem gambling? And the first step in conducting a systematic review is to create a structured question to guide the review. Uh, so uh, what people say is, this is what I want to know, and they very precisely say, I'm interested in the evidence between these years and these years, you know, and these databases and this range of therapies in a very, uh, uh, a very clear way. The second step is to perform a, a, a thorough search of the literature for relevant papers. The methodology section of a systematic review will list all the databases and citation index were searched, such as Weather Science, Embase, and PubMed, I'll show you PubMed, and any individual journals that were searched. The titles and abstracts of identified articles are checked against predetermined criteria for eligibility and relevance to form an inclusion set. The set will relate back to the research question. So people will search and they may, may come up with thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of articles and they have to go through each one and decide whether this meets uh, the inclusion criteria of the systematic review. Then each included study may be assigned an objective assessment of methodological quality, preferably by using methods conforming to the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analyses PRISMA statement or the high quality standards of Cochrane. I'll tell you about that later. Systematic reviews often, but not always, use statistical techniques, meta-analysis, to combine the results of eligible studies or at least scoring of the levels of evidence depending on the methodology used. So you can get an idea that to do a system review is a huge job. You could spend a year, you know, a team of people a year, not spending the whole year, but stretched over a year to do um, something like that. So when people do systematic reviews now, they actually specify them, they register them up front. So for example, I'm currently involved in a systematic review to look at stigma uh, towards people with severe mental disorders. And we're doing a systematic review and meta-analysis. And what you do is you register it on this website called Prospero. Prospero, International Prospective Register of Systematic Reviews. So I looked at whether they had anything on gambling. And somebody is carrying out currently this one, Casino Self-Exclusion of Systematic Review. There's the names of the people. And they're saying what their review question is, the searches they're undertaking, what they're including and, and, and excluding and so on in a fair degree of detail. And the reason they're doing that is they're stating up front they've got to what they're gonna do so they can't bias it. Because you could do a systematic review and it might be that I, you know, I look at the results and I think, well, my favorite therapy is this one and it's not doing so well. So, but if I exclude these studies, well, it will look a lot better or exclude certain types of client populations because, well, it's not really fair to my favorite therapy. So I can bias it. So in Prospero, you gotta say upfront what you're gonna do before you look at the results. And you've gotta report what you said you do, and if you change it, you've got to give a justification for why you changed it. So the whole thing is, is very much geared towards being as objective as possible. So this is, this is the sort of thing people do. This is from one that was done on gambling, and people have to do this sort of flow chart. So if you look at the top left, records identified through database searching. So they found 637 records through looking at PubMed and other databases. And then on the right, additional records identified through other sources, they got two. So after they found duplicates, so different databases will come up with the same item. They had 447 records of possible uh, studies. They screened those and they excluded 427 of them. So all but 20 got excluded because they didn't cover what they thought. Then they go to the full text of the articles, not just the summaries, and there are 20 of them. And they then excluded 12 of those and they left with eight at the end, eight out of 637, 639 they started with. 
and then they can get, get quantitative data for a meta-analysis out of six. So some systematic reviews I've been involved in, you can start with tens of thousands and you get down to a very small number and it's a huge job to screen through all those systematically. So this is the degree of thoroughness people have. They're really laying out what they do. So when they do and get all the articles, people then often use this method called meta-analysis or it's a family of methods. And it's a way of making a super big study really. So what you do is you extract summaries of the data from all the studies and you pool them together to get a big, you know, much better estimate as though you've got a, a single super study. So it's a statistical method used to work out how strong the effect of an intervention is by pooling the data from all studies. And what a meta-analysis does, it calculates a thing called an effect size for each study. And this is a way of converting all the various measures used across studies onto a common scale. So if you had a gambling study and people had different questionnaires to measure problem gambling, and they don't all use the same questionnaire. If they all use the same questionnaire, you can just get the scores from the scales and you can look at how much change each intervention does. But often they'll use different scales. So people have this clever statistical way to put them on a common scale. And you can understand this intuitively. So if you get a, an effect size of zero, it means that the intervention for problem gambling is no different from a control group. It's nothing, nothing happened, no effect. If you get a positive, it means that the intervention is better than the control. And if you get a negative, it did worse. And people often use as a rough idea to interpret, they often use these definitions of small, medium and large. So zero means nothing. It didn't work compared to the control. Negative means it got, they got worse than the control. 0.2, they say is small effect size, 0.5 is medium and 0.8 is large. So that gives you a rough idea, the sort of numbers you'd expect out of a, out of a meta-analysis. So here's an example. This is a meta-analysis on pharmacological treatment of pathological gambling. So this is where they looked at various drug treatments for pathological gambling. And uh, I've got a graph from this article that says opiate antagonist forest plot. So opiate antagonist is the class of drugs. And they're using this graph called a forest plot and it just shows effect sizes. So I don't know if I can show you, I can't point. Anyway, if you look at the scale down the bottom where it goes from minus one through to zero and then up to 2.5, that's the effect size. So zero means no effect. A minus means that the intervention actually made people worse and a positive up to there, 2.5, means it made people better. And there you see they've got six studies, Kim 2001, and its effect size, the SMD there is 1.506, so it's quite a big effect size. And you can see it's plotted there and it's got this, this line that goes outside, that's the confidence interval. That means how rubbery is the estimate. It's a really big study. We get a very precise estimate of it. It's a small study with, it's very uncertain. So then there's Grant 2006, it had 0.516, that's a, not a bad effect size. Grant 2008, 0.380, small to medium. Tianetto, 0.054, that's virtually zero. And then Grant 2010 got a minus, minus 0.178, actually made them worse. And then down the bottom, I got overall 0.183. So that's a small effect size. So it says when you put all these five studies, what you're getting overall, there's a lot of variability, but you pull them, you're getting a small effect of um, opiate antagonists in the meta-analysis. Um, when people carry out these systematic reviews, there are a couple of organizations that specialize in them. One is called the Cochrane Collaboration. It's named after this guy called Archie Cochrane, long dead, who was a medical practitioner who was an early advocate for clinicians looking at evidence. And he pointed out that people often did things in clinical practice, everyday clinical practice, that were, had no evidence or sometimes were contrary to the evidence. And so people named this uh, international collaboration after him. Um, there's an Australian branch, Cochrane Australia, I've got their website here. So it says here, Cochrane is an independent not-for-profit organisation made up of 37,000 contributors from 130 countries. We work together to make the vast amounts of evidence generated through research useful and accessible for individuals, organisations and governments around the world. Cochrane produces trusted health information in the form of systematic reviews that are free from commercial sponsorship and other conflicts of interest. So anyone can register to do a Cochrane review. You register that you're going to do it. They have all these detailed handbooks saying how you've got to do it, very rigid way. And then they have reviewers who'll go through it and make sure you did it exactly the way you were supposed to according to the handbook. To do a Cochrane review, is a, I've only ever done one of them. So I'd never do another one. It's a huge amount of work, absolutely. And they don't pay you to do it. 
you know, it's all a voluntary organisation. So if you go into Cochrane, they have a database where you can search, and I search for gambling, and this is what I came up with, psychological therapies for pathological and problem gambling. So there they give you a summary of what they found, and then they give you the author's conclusions as the bottom line. This review supports the efficacy of CBT, cognitive behaviour therapy, in reducing gambling behaviour and other symptoms of pathological and problem gambling immediately following therapy. However, the durability of therapeutic gain is unknown. There is preliminary evidence for some benefits from motivational interviewing therapy in terms of reduced gambling behaviour, although not necessarily other symptoms of pathological and problem gambling. However, these findings are based on few studies and additional research is needed to inform conclusions. There's also evidence suggests there was some possible benefit from integrative therapies and other psychological therapies for pathological problem gambling. However, there are too few studies and evidence is insufficient to evaluate these therapies. The majority of studies in this review varied in risk of bias and much of the evidence comes from studies with multiple limitations. The current data may thus reflect overestimates of treatment efficacy. So that's all very cautious. So they're saying, okay, CBT works in the short term. We don't know that it works for the long term. Bit of evidence of motivational interviewing, but you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about the evidence basically. So that's Cochrane reviews are typically like that. They always have lots of uncertainty in them, and they're always calling for more evidence. There's another organization that really is modeled on Cochrane called the Campbell Collaboration, and it's aiming to get beyond medicine. So all this evidence-based movement began as evidence-based medicine, but then it spread into other areas. And the and you hear now evidence-based everything, not that just evidence-based medicine. So the Campbell Collaboration looks at other areas. So if you look at the, the down the bottom there, they have a list of dot points so that they cover crime and justice, disability, education, international development, knowledge translation, implementation, nutrition, and social welfare. They, they are not as big. They haven't been going as long as Cochrane. They don't have many reviews. I searched for gambling, and I could not find anything with the keyword gambling in but they potentially could carry, could um, include um, gambling interventions. Uh, then another way to find uh, interventions that have been reviewed is there's a US government agency called SAMHSA, which stands for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And they have in-house staff who go and look at different interventions and they do their own ratings on them. And it's a bit more geared, a bit more practitioner friendly. Um, all of these are very technical, so they're not easy for someone to consult, but they have this thing called NREP, the uh, National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices. So it's free, you can go into that, you can put in the keyword gambling and you can see what comes out. And for example, here comes out one called Stat Deck, a program to prevent problem gambling. So they tell you, what is Stat Deck? Stat Deck, Prevent Problem Gambling is a school-based prevention program that provides information about the myths and realities of gambling and guidance on making good choices with the objective of modifying attitudes, beliefs, and ultimately gambling behavior. The intervention is provided to students in the ninth through the 12th grade as part of regularly scheduled class, such as health education or career management. Trained facilitators, teachers, prevention specialists, or health educators use a facilitator's guide to administer the 50 to 90 minute interactive lessons over a period of two to three weeks. So they give you a description of what's involved. Um, to get on NREP, it has to have evidence, so it doesn't, it doesn't get in. So everything that's in NREP has some supporting evidence. And then if you, if you drill down, you can go and look at all the detail of all the outcomes they measured and which groups it's been researched on. Um, probably for a practitioner, the best thing is just to look at the first paragraph up there. It's, it's past their, uh, you know, their standards of evidence-based. Um, but you can, you, can, you can check out the whole detail of how they do it if you want to. Another, another tool of evidence-based medicine or evidence-based healthcare in general is clinical practice guidelines. And these are documents where uh, a, a panel, an expert panel, reviews the evidence for clinicians and puts them together as guidance for different types of clinical problem. And Often they have um, some advice they give, which they call evidence-based, which is like there's been a systematic review of the evidence and meta-analysis. And they have others which, where they call consensus-based guidelines where clinicians have got to do something, but there isn't any trial. So 
the, the experts say what they think basically and they call their uh, consensus based guideline. So the National Health and Medical Research Council has a website of the Australian Clinical Practice Guidelines portal and you can go in there and you can find out whether there are guidelines on any, any health related topic and they have certain standards they have before a guideline can be uh, registered uh, and you can go in there and search for gambling so there i went in there i searched for gambling and it said no guidelines have been found please try again now that really puzzled me because i know there are gambling clinical practice guidelines but why they're not in there i don't know it was a very good question so then I, I did a search on Google and I came up with what I knew to exist, Guideline for Screening, Assessment and Treatment of Problem Gambling, Monash University and the University of Melbourne, which is supposed to have to be to the standards that uh, NHNRC have. So when you go inside these guidelines, they, have, uh, they give summaries of, of uh, recommendations and they have three categories of recommendations. The first are evidence-based recommendations. So Evidence-based recommendations were assigned a grade based on the strength of evidence. This is the levels of evidence table. The consistency of evidence across studies, the likely clinical impact, and the degree to which the evidence can be generalised and applied to the Australian context. Evidence-based recommendations are only made where there is sufficient evidence. Okay, so they have a really, really detailed process for looking at evidence, and they use the NHLSE levels of evidence. Then they have number two, consensus-based recommendations. In the absence of sufficient evidence, and where appropriate, consensus-based recommendations are formulated based on clinical opinion and expertise. And further, they have practice points. Practice points for standalone or company evidence-based or consensus-based recommendations. They are formulated to provide relevant clinical practical advice and information. So that's pretty typical, what you get in guidelines. So when you look at uh, the evidence-based guidelines, uh, you know, they have again categories of recommendations so the evidence based they say a body of evidence can be trusted to guide practice b body of evidence can be trusted to guide practice in most situations c body of evidence provides some sort of support for recommendations that care should be taken as application d body of evidence is weak and recommendation must be applied with caution then they have consensus based ones recommendation based on expert opinion as insufficient evidence available and then they have practice points and then they have definitions, very thorough but definitions of what's no evidence, what's insufficient evidence, and what's sufficient evidence. So these are very tedious things. People can spend years, you know, a panel of people working on one of these uh, practice guidelines. So here's an example from these gambling guidelines, recommendations for screening and assessment. So here's a consensus-based recommendation. Those who screen positive for problem gambling using an initial brief that is one to three items, I can't quite read it from here. Screening tools should be referred for further assessment and treatment by appropriately trained specialist practitioners for problem gambling. Screening should be used in primary care settings where at-risk clients may be presenting for services. These may include people who present for other mental health problems, people who come from groups with reliably high rates of problem gambling. So they made this recommendation, they have no trials to support it, so they're doing it because they, as a, pan as a panel of experts, who are producing the guidelines think this is a good thing to do, but they're saying it's just we think so, we don't have any trials. And there's another consensus-based recommendation, number two, adults with high risk of mental health problems, including those who are presenting for treatment or for assessment for mental health problems, could be screened and assessed for problem gambling using a validated measurement tool or tools. And then they recommend different tools that they could use. And then they have these other recommendations, they have evidence. So that they, they've done a systematic review and they're a trial. So here's evidence-based recommendation one. Individual or group cognitive behaviour therapy should be used to reduce gambling behaviour, gambling severity and psychological distress in people with gambling problems. And it's got level B evidence. Another recommendation, motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement therapy should be used to reduce gambling behaviour and gambling severity in people with gambling problems, level B evidence and so on. So, uh, you know, this is another category. And you can see from the earlier systematic reviews I had um, that came up, they've recommended the cognitive behaviour therapy and motivation interviewing. What evidence there was, it wasn't perfect, but they did seem to be indicated as effective. So, and that's been reflected in these guidelines. Now, various people have um, been critical about evidence-based practice. 
And I'll tell you about some of the reasons why people are being critical. And some people have drawn this distinction between what they call evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence. So in evidence-based medicine, EBM, the big standard is the randomized control trial. So that's the ultimate. You get a randomized control trial, that is, you assign people randomly, with say problem gambling, to an intervention or to a control and you see which has the better outcome. Even better if you can get a systematic review or a meta-analysis of randomized control trials. However, when you look at these randomized control trials, they don't generally reflect realistic practice. They're done under idealized conditions. Um, and it may be very different from sort of everyday use. So what is cognitive behavior therapy in a trial may not be cognitive behavior therapy as say the average psychologist might use it in everyday practice. So practice-based evidence really is sort of an appeal to look at what happens under usual clinical conditions. So even if we mightn't have the, the ultimate standard, scientific standard of a randomized controlled trial, it might be so rigorous, they're saying we should also look at evidence about what works under these realistic conditions and that's telling us something else that complements the evidence that we get from randomized controlled trials. Another problem related to this from randomized controlled trials and evidence-based medicine is there are some questions that can't answer through randomized controlled trials. And when you look at the um, look at the, the clinical practice guidelines around and they have these consensus-based recommendations, they are often questions and you think, well, how could you ever do a randomized controlled trial on that? And sometimes you couldn't, you could never do a randomized controlled trial. So there are always going to be gaps where that sort of methodology is never going to be applicable. Sometimes practically or even ethically, you cannot do it. So an example, this is one that I've been involved in and the foundation that provided the grant to do this. The, the question was, how can a member of the public, not a clinician, but a member of the public, best assist someone they think may have a gambling problem? So you cannot say to people, family members say, or work colleagues or friends or someone they think might have a gambling problem, we're gonna randomly assign you to do this or this or this, and then we're gonna measure the outcome. We can't get the people to measure the outcome. We can't ethically or practically randomly assign. So how on earth can you ever get evidence? Well, the best possible evidence you could probably get in that situation is expert consensus. You can ask people who have practical experience in the area, what they would do in that circumstance. You're assuming they have some wisdom they've got from their everyday practice or their experience as a carer or their experience as somebody who's had a gambling problem about what might be likely to work. And um, you can use that as the basis. So this is some way of getting practice-based evidence, a type of practice-based evidence. So some people would say, like when you look at the hierarchies of evidence, like the Joanna Briggs one, like expert consensus is a really low level of evidence. But I think it's often underestimated because there is this evidence uh, from uh, psychology, uh, decision-making about what now, nowadays they call it the wisdom of crowds. So there was a popular book called The Wisdom of, the Wisdom of Crowds by James Sirowicki. It's a popular so, social science book. And what he argues in that is that groups of people, which he called crowds, under the right conditions can make very good judgments. And that book is really a whole lot of case examples of where that can occur. And this term, the wisdom of crowds, has now been adopted in the sort of uh, the decision science literature. They use it and it's come from his book. So this work began, the first published bit of work on it began in the very early years of the 20th century when a famous British scientist called Francis Galton, a very famous person from that era, went to an agricultural fair in England and um, they were having a competition there where people are coming along looking at the livestock like farmers and you know butchers or whatever. And they had a competition where you could pay some money and you could, they had this ox there and you could make an estimate of the weight of the carcass of the ox when it had been butchered. So, People um, paid money, wrote their guesses on cards. And Francis Galton, being interested in things like statistics at that time, he asked for all the cards afterwards and he got them. So he got 800 guesses 
and he found that the average was actually the median of the 800 guesses was 1,197 pounds. And the actual weight of the ox was 1,198 pounds. So although people make very wide estimates, you put them all together, they all have some expertise about the weights of animals, butchered animals, but they're imperfect, put them together and they do a better job. So nowadays people do it, say, with a jar of jelly beans. So you say, how many, how many uh, jelly beans in a jar? I've tried this. I've also got a little jar of rice and I've asked people to estimate how many rice grains in the jar. I've done things like get people to estimate my height and weight. And it's sort of quite interesting with some of these tasks, like my, estimating my height, people give huge variation, but the, the mean and the median are actually spot on. Weight, people tend to uh, underestimate, and I think maybe they're being polite or something, I don't know, but they tend to underestimate weight. So often these things work if you do it under certain conditions. So um, Sarah Wiki proposed a number of conditions in which you could make good decisions. And the way you don't make a good decision is to get a group of experts sitting around a table and discussing it, because what happens is the, you know, the, the dominant person, the top dog, will tend to dominate. Uh, people won't voice their doubts you know, in front of other people. So what you've got to do is get people to make independent judgments, the way people are making the guesses on the weight of the ox. So one method of doing this is a method called Delphi. It's been around since the 1950s. It's a way of getting expert consensus. And it has a number of the features that Sarah Wiki said you should do. So what you do in Delphi is you select a question you want to answer. For example, how does a member of the public assess someone they know who is suicidal? Or how does a member of the public assess someone they know as a gambling problem? Then you select a group of experts on this topic. For example, you could say, okay, academics have published on suicide prevention, they have expertise. The experts don't meet. The communication is by post. Nowadays, it's often by the internet, so you can get an international panel of people all around the world. And what you do is you make up a questionnaire for the experts. So what you want to do is to give them the menu of all the possible things that could be done. If you're a member of the public and you concern someone might be suicidal, what's the total menu of possible actions you could take? So what you do is you try and get that full range and you make them a statement in a questionnaire. So what you know, the studies I've done is we go and search the internet, we search clinicians, manuals, carer, guides and so on. We come up with all the things people say, and sometimes they're contradictory. One will say do this, one will say do the opposite. Sometimes we think they're stupid, we don't judge it. We put them all down, huge questionnaire, hundreds of items about you should do this, you should not do that. And then the experts privately rate their agreement about whether these statements are likely to help or not. Then you compile all their independent judgments and you give them feedback. You say, this is what you said about, okay, the person suicidal, tell them they'll go to hell if they commit suicide because that will stop them. You know, that's something people say. So, so this is what you said, this is what the panel as a whole said, and then you can reconsider and change your judgment if you would like. And then you get statements where there's a high consensus and you accept those and that's the basis then for uh, recommended action. So when you do one of these Delphi studies, it's very much like doing a systematic review. You've got to try and find all of the all of the ideas that are out there about what to do. So here's an example of one uh, that was done where people search through websites, 2,400 books, 405 journal articles, 392, and they went through all of these and searched for anything that say a, you know a person could help in this circumstance and they ended up with a smaller number at the end and they searched all the ideas and analyzed the ideas and made them into a questionnaire very thorough and then you've got to have a panel you know so you say okay who are the experts and you've got to define it so here's an example you have a professional panel you say they've got to be 18 years or older they've got to live in australia canada ireland new zealand united kingdom the united states or english speaking countries and have a minimum of two years experience specializing in research or treatment of problem gambling. And then you can have lived experience panel, 18 years and older from the same countries, have a lived experience of gambling problems, but are currently recovered and have experience in an advocacy or peer support role, or are a family member or friend who has assisted a person with a gambling problem and have experience in an advocacy or peer support role. So you're getting two sorts of expertise, professional and people who have personal experiences as someone affected or a family member or supporter. So then what you do is you give this long questionnaire, we did this, say with how you help someone's problem gambling, we had 
the top we had 320 items and they went out to the panelists and then we get some items that reach a cutoff and we had a cutoff you've got to have 80 percent of each panel had to agree this was a good thing to do and then they get included and then we get some items that are close 79 70 to 79 percent and we put them back in a second round questionnaire uh, give people feedback on what the other panelists said and then the panelists suggest other things. They say, well, you haven't thought of this. And so we get new items and we put them in the questionnaire. So we go through several, usually three rounds of questionnaires to the panel. It's a huge commitment from them. And we get the items at the end from the initial screening we did of items in our search for other items they suggested about things that could be done. And we end up at the end with 234 items that can be used by somebody to help someone with problem gambling. And then we put these into text. So we made these helping someone with gambling problems, mental health first aid guidelines. These are a group of texts and it's all based around these endorsed statements. So this continuous bit of, bit of text goes back to the panel and they give final approval to it. So when you do something like this and you come up with one of the, either if you come up with clinical practice guidelines or something like this, first aid guidelines for the public, they actually in themselves do nothing. They're actually in themselves, if, you, if that's all you do, they're a complete waste of time because they will not change behavior. So it's well recognized now with clinical practice guidelines, one of the basic tools of evidence-based medicine, that you can have a professional college, you know, medical college or uh, psychological society or whatever, social workers, they can do these guidelines, they can publish them on the web and they can print them up and they can send them to members but it will not in themselves change anyone's behavior. So what you've got to do is always have a process. Well, how are we going to change people through this? That has to be part of it. It can't end with the guidelines. So when we did this uh, Delphi study to have, find out how members of the public could assist with game problems, we did have a strategy. It was all a means to an end. It's all a means to develop some intervention. We also did the same thing with, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people because they have a higher frequency of gambling problems. So we did the same process there. And we also got items that are cultural, that have things that you need to know about gambling problems or how you approach someone who's identified as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander that might be different. If you're not from that cultural group, what are the additional things you need to know? And then we got a panel of uh, people who are either Aboriginal people who are experts in gambling or we had sometimes some non-Aboriginal people who had uh, expertise in, in treatment or prevention of Aboriginal gambling problems and we got their consensus. So you can use this sort of method to get uh, cultural expertise as well. And again, cultural expertise is something you can't get in a randomised controlled trial. The only way is to really ask people who have that expertise and then you use that to convey to others. So what we did now and what's been happening is that Mental Health First Aid Australia that got the grant in its latest uh, standard Mental Health First Aid manual, fourth edition, there is a chapter now on gambling problems. So members of the public are trained in how to assist people with a variety of mental health problems. And there is a chapter in there on how to help people with gambling problems. And it's based around these expert consensus guidelines. So Mental Health First Aid training now, there are uh, over half a million people have had that in Australia and about 2 million worldwide. So most of those people haven't had the problem gambling in input because we, it didn't exist. So it didn't exist in the first three editions, but in the fourth edition it's there. Um, so it's not actually taught in the training course because there isn't the time, but people learn an action plan for how to help. And then in the manual, it does have it if you want to apply that action plan to some of the problem gambling, it's available for you there and it has similar principles. And starting early next year, a specific intervention on um, you know, providing first aid, if you're a member of the public, to some of the gambling problems will be developed. So there'll be a short type of mental health state course focusing specifically on uh, problem gambling and an evaluation will be carried out on that to see its impact on what actions people take. So, the basic message I want to say is evidence-based medicine has a lot of good things about it. It's been generalised beyond medicine to a whole lot of areas of professional practice. Uh, it's a very rigorous uh, process, a very time-consuming process, but in itself it won't change clinical practice. You've got to have um, 
you've got to have a, a mechanism to, to get implementation because people from on its own, it will not convince people to, to, to do things differently. So you've got to have something else that's going to do it. And there are some problems that it, it cannot answer because there are some things where this randomized control trial methodology is just not feasible or ethical and you've got to have uh, other approaches, and I've given you this approach, how you could systematically gather expert consensus as a way to fill uh, some of these gaps where you can't do randomized control trials. And given you mental health as day training as an example of then how you can take that um, and um, apply it. So in the mental first aid manual, if you go into the gambling problem, it not only has a chapter, not only it tells you what to do if you're a first aider, but it also has actually uh, text in there, at layman's level, about those clinical, those guidelines that are available, the Australian guidelines for, for, for treatment of problem gambling. And it has text in there, it's based. It says, these are the evidence-based treatments. If you go and get professional help, or you're assisting somebody to get professional help, this is what you should get. These are the services that are available that you can get. So all of that evidence-based information from trials is incorporated there as well. So it's a way of disseminating this uh, to the public. So that, that brings me to the end. So I don't know how the technology works, whether we can have questions and discussion. If I'd done this with a live audience, I would have done it much more interactively, but given I'm only looking at a screen, it's, uh, it's rather difficult to do that, to get that sort of feedback and two-way interaction. So Eddie's gonna switch it over now, so. I can hear from you. Yes. So if anyone, if anyone's got any questions, just the mics are on. Or if you'd like to use the chat box here, um, please go ahead and, and write some questions in and Anthony will be able to um, answer anything you've got. Um, hi, my name's Suzanne. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, oh, Suzanne. Great. Thank you. That was a really great presentation. I just wanted to clarify I've understood something correctly. So if I was wanting to access more of that evidence-based, uh, sorry, more of the practice-based evidence, are you saying that that's mainly kind of embedded into clinical guidance? Because you, we've got quite a long list of ways to get the evidence-based practice, all the RCT stuff. Mm. But the best way to get to the, the flip side of that, the practice-based evidence? Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. So if you go to, you know, Cochrane Reviews, Campbell Reviews, um, and NREP, they won't tell you that. They'll be based around the, the trial evidence. If you want to get the, uh, you know, the consensus view from experts where there are gaps in that trial evidence, then it would be in clinical practice guidelines, and they will usually distinguish between the basis of their recommendation, each recommendation they made, whether it's based on uh, clinical practice or based on trials. Now, in, 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 in practice with these guidelines, the distinction is rather artificial because when they have panels, that you know, people who write these guidelines, um, when you look at the trials, they can't just take the trials and just make that into a guideline. They've got to use their expertise to... Um, you know, to make up a statement that's relevant to practice from from the trial. So there is always a trend, there is always an expert consensus process. But either the expert consensus involves looking at the trials and the experts saying, well, how do we use that in practice? Or it involves people using their practical experience that's not trial-based to, to come up with some recommendation. And in some areas you can have both, like you know, I've been involved, say, in Delphi studies where we're looking at prevention. And you know the evidence on prevention, like on parenting. So a lot of the evidence on parenting and what parents can do for prevention comes from longitudinal studies, and not from trials. And often the longitudinal studies you know, don't tell you a lot of detail about what to do. So you can do both. You can have like a, a, a panel of experts, and you can give them reviews of the longitudinal evidence, so they can use their practical experience, other knowledge they have, and they can use the systematic review of say longitudinal studies you provide them and combine them together to make their judgments. Okay, all right, great, thank you. And um, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Um, if your microphone isn't working for whatever reason, please do um, use the chat function here and I'll be able to um, uh, read out the question for uh, Tony to go through. I think. I 
That's it. That's yeah, fine. I think we're, we're okay. Uh, look, if anyone has any questions, um, we, I can please send them into myself, Etty. Um, you all have my email address and I'll pass them on to Tony and uh, Tony will be able to respond. Um, you may have some questions after this, but thank you very much to uh, Tony for webinar today. And um, I'm going to exit. If anyone has any other questions, do, um, you know, do, do stay on the line. Um, I think we're okay, we're just getting, oh, we're just getting thank yous now. <laughs> Great. Okay, guys, um, thanks very much. And um, I'm gonna end this meeting now. Take care.